Good afternoon, family. Welcome to the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church Midweek Devotional Bible Study. I am the Reverend Lukata Mjumbe. I'm the pastor of Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church based in Princeton, New Jersey, and we come together each week on Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. to study, to consider, to examine, to explore what thus saith the Lord. Let me just say this. In order for you to participate in this study of what we consider to be the Word of God, this Bible study. You do not have to be a member of Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. You don't have to be a Presbyterian. You don't have to be either uh, a Methodist or a Baptist or a Pentecostal or of any particular faith tradition at all. You don't have to be uh, Christ-like or a Christian. You don't have to be a Muslim in submission to the will of God. Uh, you have to be someone who acknowledges that you are a creature that you are a creation, and that you want to know the truth. You want to know what the Bible says about the truth. You want to explore, examine, question, think about, and we welcome you. Whatever tradition you might come from, with whatever questions that you may have, come on in. You can participate on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat, and we'll try to to track them and follow them. And if we don't get to your questions in in real time, then we'll, we'll follow up and try to uh, see if we can uh, get to them later. But let me just say this, that just because you have a question, it doesn't mean that I or any of the other people who are on this Zoom call will have the answers. Uh, if you'd like to join a future Zoom call, you're welcome uh, to, to, to come and join us on Wednesdays. But just because you join doesn't mean that you have all of the answers either. And so there will be times where we just shrug our shoulders and say we don't know. There are times where we say, well, we think that's knowable and maybe we can go and research it. Uh, but we encourage the questioning that we're supposed to love the Lord with all of our minds as well. And so we want questions. Uh, we seek answers that answer and solutions that solve, but we know that the best of those belong to God and that there are some things that are revealed to us, but there are some things that remain within the mystery and belong only to God. So so welcome. I'll say a little bit more about what we're studying, but we're going we're gonna to focus on scripture today. We're, we're also going to uh, talk a little bit about the book that we're studying. I've asked for uh, those who were on Zoom and those with us last week to not even go into the reading itself because uh, I want us to focus uh, clearly on some of the text. Uh, I do, if we have time, I'm going to read it, uh, but I don't want you to all to, to, to act. I want you just to listen. I want you to hear it, uh, and I want you to experience it, because the way that it reads, it really is designed uh, to try to put you in that place, and, and, and rather than you reading it, and I know we have some some biblical scholars here that like to slice and dice and, and dissect as they do their exegetical work, but, but there are times when we just need to listen and experience. Uh, we'll do the slice and the dice and on the text. So let's begin with a prayer. We're going to pray over the word of God. Lord God, thank you for the blessing of this day. Thank you for all of those that are joining. Thank you for those that are here on Zoom, coming from all kinds of places and spaces. Thank you for those who are, who are watching on Facebook live stream or on YouTube who are watching now on Wednesday at 1230 in the middle of the week or those who may watch at some other point in the week as we move toward what the traditional church calls Holy Week that begins next Sunday on Palm Sunday, Lord God. As we dig into these texts, these texts that help us to have background and context for what is known as Palm Sunday, Lord God. We pray that you give us eyes to see what is revealed in, in Psalm 122, what is revealed in Zechariah 9, what is revealed to us in Luke the 19th chapter, Lord God. Give us eyes to see, minds to understand, hearts to receive, and give us the right questions, even if we don't come up with the right answers. Help us to, to dig, to interrogate, because we want to know you. We want to understand you. We don't want just to have a word preached to us or talked about to us or, or have it be a part of our tradition and our historical memory, Lord God. We want it to live. We want it to have real meaning in real time with us right now, Lord God. We devote ourselves to this study. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together, amen. 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 All right. So um, our... Our study, for those who are watching on Facebook and YouTube, is coming 
from this book, We Make the Road by Walking, which is by a public theologian by the name of Brian McLaren, a year-long quest for spiritual formation, reorientation, and activation. And uh, there is a, a chapter for each week, and each week there's a set of Bible verses that provide the context for what the chapter will explore in a narrative form. This week, uh, there were three different passages of Scripture, and what I asked for, for those of us who joined us last week to do is not even do the, the reading. Uh, let's just focus on the the, the text because uh, we, those of us who are a part of the Christian church, those of us who may have grown up in the church or have been in it some time, have, have had our experiences in uh, the beginning of what's called Holy Week with Palm Sunday. So before I even go to the text, I want to just open it up to those who are joining and I and I see Norma and, and Bruce and Mariamu, and I know we have Sharon and Nicole and, and, and Kim that are, that are also on with us right now. And for those of us who are watching, we, we have a, a faithful group of folks who connect over uh, some of the Facebook pages. And um, tell me what you know about Palm Sunday. What your experiences have been in Palm Sunday. If you've uh, grown up in a church or if you're in a church now, what what are the practices and what are the things that are done during Palm Sunday and what do you remember about some of what has been preached if you remember at all about what is preached about Palm Sunday? Whosoever will. Anybody? I'll go. Um. Palm Sunday uh, is the Sunday before Easter. And so we always look forward to uh, receiving palms at church. And at the end of service, we wave them back and forth and we sing, you know, one of the songs that's related to uh, glorifying Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You know, the King is coming, that kind of thing. and. Usually every year after I get my palms, I take them home and I bend them into the shape of a cross and I switch the palms from last year and put up the fresh palms for this year. Um, you put them I, up where? On my wall. On the wall, okay. On the wall. Mm -hmm. oh, and um, it's a celebration that we have come, I guess we are headed towards the most important uh, time in, in uh, Christian history to me because we're headed towards the time that Jesus is going to uh, sacrifice his life for our sins so that we can be redeemed back to God. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Other poem. Palm Sunday Reflections. Other Palm Sunday Reflections about what you've experienced, what you remember, what you do, what you remember being preached, what Palm Sunday, uh, what Palm Sunday means to you. Norma. She's muted. Um, I, uh, along with what uh, Mariamu said, uh, I also think forward beyond um, Palm Sunday, uh, and I see it as this glorious celebratory period, uh, but that very soon the tide turns and these same people who were glorifying God and praising him turn against him. Mm. Okay, yeah. So Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, as it as it was mentioned by Mariamu, that it mm -hmm. it, con it it concludes. It comes the Sunday before what's called Easter Sunday, a Resurrection Sunday. But during the week, there are some other things that happen. Right, Norm, I'm going to mute you for your background. There there are some other things that that happen. Uh, uh, depending on which gospel that you that that you read, you have Jesus that. That, that comes into the uh, the courtyard of the temple, 
And what does Jesus do when he when he comes into into the temple in Jerusalem? He turns over the tables of the money changers. Turns over the tables of the money changers. He pulls out a, a whip. He he runs them out. He has some choice words for them. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. Um, uh, depending on again which which gospel you're reading in the order that you know that that happened on the 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 same day or the next day, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what else happens that week? Was that the Last Supper? Was that the Last Supper? The Last Supper occurs. What what day of the week was that? Not Friday. Right. Hmm? Friday? Nope, day Thursday. Thursday. Thursday night. Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, on the night that he was yeah, to be arrested. Not Maundy Thursday. Yeah, but on the mm -hmm. on the night before. Uh, Maundy Thursday or Holy mm -hmm. Thursday. Maundy means mandate mm -hmm. is when there was a, uh, from, the, from the Latin uh, uh, mandatus, uh, which means where, where, where Christ gave uh, a mandate or a command of what they were to do. Do this mm -hmm. in remembrance of me. Uh, and so you have the last, what's called the Last Supper. Uh, you have, um, th th there, was a, there was a movie that, that, that was made by Mel Gibson about what happened the next day. What was the name of that movie? The Passion of the Christ. Passion yes. of the Christ. And mm -hmm. so on that next day, Friday, we have all of what we remember about the uh, Jesus's walk mm -hmm. towards the cross or the stations of the cross and the abuse and the mistreatment, his arrest. Uh, we, we, we find the part where, where the, uh, he is brought up and, and, and there's a, uh, he goes before Pilate, uh, he goes before the Sanhedrin, uh, uh, he goes before the crowd. They have to choose, as Norma was saying, whether they were to set free um, uh, Jesus or Barabbas. Again, the different stories in different gospels. Um, then they, they, they choose to set Barabbas free. Uh, and and uh, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate, then... Uh, supposedly submits to the will of the crowd uh, and he is punished, he is abused, he is tortured uh, and ultimately, uh, and I'm fast forwarding because we're gonna do all of this next week, um, he is he's crucified on the cross uh, only on Friday and only to be resurrected on the third day on early Sunday morning while it's still dark. So um, Palm Sunday though is what we're gonna focus on today. And I, I, I want to ask some specific questions. And if you don't really know, you don't have to answer, or you can just say, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, why do we wave the palms? Mommy, you talked about that's something that you do in church, and then you even take mm -hmm. the, the palms and you uh, uh, bend them into the, the shape of a cross. Why do you why do you wave the palms back? When the people in the different books that I read, when the people at that time heard that Jesus was coming, they went out to welcome him and they laid their clothes down on the ground. They cut palms, uh, palms off off the trees and things, and they were celebrating the coming of the king. Okay. And so they, they were waving palms. So when we do it in church, it's kind of like the celebration of the uh, king is coming. The reenactment. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, go ahead. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, Palm Sunday hasn't been something that I ever really focused on, but I think I feel like last year because we had Bible study last year. Was this the time? Is that where the scripture says, uh, "If you." You held up a rock. You were like the rocks will cry out. So I don't wave a palm. I wave rocks now, um, <laughs> because you said if the if the people don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. So I was like, I, I got rocks all over. But I'm like, so is that? Why do you say about the rocks? Tell about that. Well, you know, like I said, there's 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 different renderings of mm -hmm. what happened on this day. Uh, today in our passage of scripture, we read from uh, Luke. Uh, chapter 19 and you know and if we and if we look at Luke chapter 19 then you 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 find a particular rendering of the account and it's interesting and I don't know and we'll see this when we read it but I but I want you to find the palms in in Luke 19 
there, there, there aren't any poems there. Um, it, it's not mentioned at all. But if we go to Mark uh, 11, which also tells the story of, of, of Palm Sunday, uh, it does say that they um, sp they spread leafy branches. Uh, there, there, there's no there's no mention of the the palms there, but there are leafy branches and there are cloaks uh, that are that are laid out uh, before. And then if we go to Matthew 19, mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, uh, no, Matthew 21, I'm sorry. And Matthew 21, when we find the rendering of the Palm Sunday story, um, there we, we, we have uh, the, the, the situation where you have, um, let's see, do we have branches? Do, do we have, I don't think we have palms there either. Um, I think we do. Yeah, we, don't, we, we have cloaks on the ground, uh, but we don't, we don't have, we don't have palms. Uh, we don't we don't have palms there listed as a part of the uh, uh, of the procession, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then when we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, um, starting in verse 12, when it talks about the uh, the, the, the triumphant uh, entry uh, into Jerusalem. And I think this is the one passage of scripture let's see to go out hosanna hosanna uh took branches of palm trees so this is where we have um the actual um we ha we, we, ha we have the actual palm trees so go back though to the, the gospel that we're reading today um, i think in john 12 is the one where it says went on and no, that's when I'm lifted up. That's the wrong. Well, that's okay. that's John twelve and twelve is the palms. Yeah. That that that's 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 where there's the 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 mention of the of, of the palms, but you know what you see is in the gospel that we read today in Luke nineteen, is where you have a different kind of reference, and uh, this is where after they say blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven glory in the highest heaven in verse thirty nine. Uh, Luke 19, verse 39. We're going to look at all this in just a second. Some mm -hmm. of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And so a couple years ago in 2019, I think it was, uh, I encouraged Witherspoon to think about um the symbols that are present in these Palm Sunday stories and said, hey, think about the significance of the stones. Because as much as we talk about the palms, palms are only mentioned in one uh, gospel. That's in the gospel of John chapter 12, verse 12. And then there's also the stones that are also mentioned in, in, in one, uh, which is in the gospel of Luke. But I consider the the response of Jesus and the reference to the, the, the stone as being even more significant from a biblical standpoint. And I mean, I won't fully unpack what I talked about then uh, in terms of, of, of it, but Jesus is basically saying there's nothing that can stop my praise. There's nothing that can prevent me from being glorified that if they don't say it, then the stones will say it. He says something similar in, 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 in the story in Matthew, in, in Matthew 21, where the, after you get past the, uh, the Palm Sunday pr pr procession and you get past him clearing out the temple and, and Jesus is healing people and laying hands on people and they're still saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, the Pharisees get mad and they're like, tell them to be quiet. And then Jesus makes this reference about, you know, and it's, and it's similar. He said, don't you know, even at the, at the, at the infants, the babies will cry out, you know, and, 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 and give me praise, you know. So, so this idea about, about a pushback against the religious, from the religious authorities, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, and Jesus saying, no, I must be praised. I must be glorified. 
is is representative and 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 I talked about in my sermon. Well, how do stones cry out? Uh, and I and I talked about one of the ways that stones cry out is when they're thrown. They're given voice when they're thrown, and and, and we can think about the struggle of the the, the Palestinian people. Uh, I think Bruce mentioned this morning about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but but oftentimes when you see that conflict, you'll see the, the Israeli government represented by tanks and soldiers with 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 uh, uh, rifles, and 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 the the Palestinian people, the uprising um, the, of the Intifada, uh, having stones, and that if we do not give God glory, if God's name is not glorified and God's will and God's way is is not upheld then the stones are going to speak then the stones are going to cry out then 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 the stones will be given voice and i and i think that there's a lot for us to consider what's happening on palm sunday palm sunday there's so much there and it's rarely fully unpacked when we uh come to church on on palm sunday we we do tend to to, to wave the palm leaves um, interestingly, some of you may not know that the ashes that are used for uh, um, Ash Wednesday are supposed to be the, 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 the palms that were used the year before and are burned. Mm -hmm. And then the ashes from those palm leaves are then used to place on your head when the cross is placed on your hand, on your head or on your hand. But this, this idea of Palm Sunday and certainly they wouldn't have called it Palm Sunday. Uh, it, it was, there was a different religious celebration going on during that time. Do we know what was happening during that time uh, and what we call Palm Sunday? Passover. Passover. Okay. So what's Passover? The angel of death passed over the um, Israelites when they were in Egypt and killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians. Right. Passover is the observance, is the celebration, is the remembrance of the Jewish people. Uh, it, it, it is a religious celebration that is continued unto this day, where the people remember their liberation from bondage in Egypt. They remember that as a part of the, 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 the final plague that God visited on Egypt uh, in order to compel Pharaoh to let the people go, that is said that the that the angel of death would pass over all of Egypt, but the but the children of Israel were given specific instructions about taking the the the, the blood and putting it uh, on the on, around the door. Uh, they, they 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 were given instructions about a meal that they were they were to prepare because they were about to go on a journey. They were even given instructions later that they were supposed to go and loot. The Egyptians and take things from them, jewelry and clothes and other sorts of things as reparations payments, I say, before they then went out into the wilderness led by Moses the Liberator. But the Passover is a revolutionary liberationist celebration of remembrance, reminding the Jewish people how they were set free from bondage. Okay? So, Passover is what was happening in this first century on this day that we call Palm Sunday and, and, and why Jesus was going into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the holy city, which is where the Jewish people would gather in remembrance of their liberation and an observance of how God had liberated them and set them free from bondage in Egypt. Now, there's an irony here that I want you to consider as Jesus has organized himself a march, and I will make the case about him organizing, organized a march up into Jerusalem. All right, Kim, thank you for, for being with us with the time that you could. Um, there was another march that was happening at the same time. Does anybody know about that march? Jesus was coming in from the east coming into Jerusalem, the, 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 the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Do you know that there was another march? There was another march that was done from the West. 
And from the West, there was a procession, a march, which came from Rome, from the Romans. Who were the Romans during this time, during this first century, in relationship to Israel, in relationship to the people of God who would be gathered in Jerusalem? What was their position? What was the what was the position of Rome or of the Romans? They were occupiers, weren't they? Absolutely. The Roman government was occupying Israel at that time. The Roman government was keeping the children of Israel in bondage. They had to pay tribute. They had to give their land. They were killed. They were crucified. They were tortured. They often had their children taken away. They were conscripted, conscripted into the military. There were all kinds of things that they were subject to under the weight, the boot of the Roman Empire, which conquered not only Israel, but occupied land and territory and peoples all over the world. So I want you to consider this. If you're a Jew, if you're one of the children of, of Israel, and you're occupied by the Roman Empire, if you're kept in bondage under the weight and the boot of the Roman Empire, what kind of feelings might be brought up within you during Passover? when you're remembering how God liberated you from a previous source of oppression and bondage, the Egyptian empire. What kind of feelings do you think might be coming up? Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's do it again. You, 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 you might be getting kind of stirred up yeah. Oh, God did it before. He'll do it again. The God's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Set me free today like you did with my ancestors. So Rome was aware of that. So every year during Passover, Rome would organize a march into Jerusalem where they would bring out their horses and their chariots and their, and their poles with the golden eagle on top and the horns, and they would march through a military procession through Jerusalem, reminding them, we're not going out like the Egyptians did. Don't get any ideas about tearing up in Jerusalem because we run this place. We are in control. Caesar is God. Caesar is august. Caesar is in control. And so just as sometimes with the American military, they'll have great military parades and you'll see the, the fighter jets that, 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 that fly in the sky and do the rotation so you can be shocked and awed at the power and the might of the military. The Roman Empire would organize these types of processions during the time of Passover to say, don't get no ideas, Jew. Don't, don't, don't be getting stirred up because we, 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 we're not like the Egyptians. We're running all of this. So you had a march, a procession from the West, from Rome and the Roman Empire, and from the East, you have little old Jesus who's riding on a on a, on the back of a of a of a colt of a donkey we're going to we're going to go to the text cuz i wanted to give some of that background before we before we dig in and we and we explore you know what 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 the scriptures say in terms of context about this day that that we call uh in our present church moment that we call uh, Palm Sunday. Any questions before we, we go to the text about what I've said? Uh, if, if you, if, if, if anybody, I don't know where that came from. That ain't in the Bible. You're right. It's not in the Bible. But let, 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 let's be clear. There were many sources of, of history, of commentary, 
of information about what was going on in the world in the first century other than the sacred text that is the Bible. And you can go back and you can look and you can find records of what was happening with the government, what was happening in terms of taxes, what was happening in terms of land use, agriculture. There's other kinds of what's called extra biblical information. But if you, if you, if you want to find a, a scholarly theological source talking about this procession of Rome from, uh, from, from the West into Jerusalem, I would encourage you to go and, and, and check out the book the Last Week, The Last Week by John Dominic Croson and Marcus Borg. Some of us who have been in this Bible study are familiar with them because we've read some of their books. But these are two theologians, one's a Protestant and one's Roman Catholic, and they help to provide a historical context in terms of what was happening so that you can understand the meaning of these stories that we have within our Bible, the, the, these accounts of what happens in the Bible. And they go through the last week every day, what happened from Palm Sunday all the way through Resurrection Sunday, and they talk about what happens each day. I would encourage you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to read it again. This year, I read it every year. It's, it's, a, it's a part of my, 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 my annual ritual to, to go back and to reread and to re-explore. But I also want us to examine and explore more closely what the Bible actually says. And there's so many biblical references from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, that are important for us to consider when we think about the, the traditions and the rituals, whether it be palms, whether it be stones, what you, what, whatever it is that we may be. I, I would love to see someday people actually take off that nice coat uh, and, and, and lay that down uh, on the ground and, and, and have a donkey walk over it. You know, I want to see that. I remember, I've seen some churches that they actually brought a live donkey and had somebody playing the part of Jesus walk in and that donkey left all kinds of stuff on that, on that beautiful red carpet. Uh, so, so if we really want to reenact, I, I think that, uh, my, my preference is to first go to reconnect with what the scripture actually says. So, there's a couple of scriptures that McLaren gave us to read for, for this week. The first one is Psalm 20, Psalm, Psalm 122, okay? <laughs> Psalm 122. And th this is a part of a group of psalms that are you see here called a, a, a song of ascent um, of David. And, and so uh, does anybody know what a, what, what, what a song of ascent is? Anybody have any, any ideas about that? A, a, a song of ascent, and it's contested by scholars in terms of some say because of how it poetically leads up to a crescendo. Um, a, a more popular argument, which I which I I tend to go with, is that these songs of ascent and Psalm 122 through 134 are all kind of grouped as these psalms of ascent. But it's it's songs that 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 pilgrims. And, and a pilgrim, is, don't, don't think about Thanksgiving and, and, and the black and white, you know, uniforms. Pilgrim is somebody who's making a pilgrimage, someone who's making a religious journey, someone who is, who, who is on a sojourn. And so a, 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 a song of ascent of David would be the, the songs that the pilgrims, people who were making their religious journeys as they prepared to go for, for Passover, for other celebrations that would be in the holy city. Jerusalem it sets up on a hill. And so, you know, and, and again, it's interesting. You do go down the Mount, you, you, you have to go up, but then you go down the Mount of Olives. But the, if you come in from that direction, um, mm -hmm that a song of ascent would be songs that were likely sung by pilgrims as they walked, as they traveled together, as they ascended into the holy city. So we, we have this, this 122nd Psalm, and most of them are pretty short. So I'll just read this one. This one's nine verses. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to the tribes, go up to the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for there the thrones of judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, may they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Amen. And we and we need to know this because, mommy, and you talked about the songs that you would sing while you were waving, that singing and celebration and expectation would have been normal of what would have been a part of what a group of people would do as they made a pilgrimage, as they ascended into the holy city. And this was a time of Passover. So we should be in expectation of, of, of voices, of sound, of celebration and, and remembrance that, that they're, they're, they're going to the house of the Lord. They're, they're seeing Jerusalem as a holy city. If we know the story of the, of the, of the Old Testament, we know how it was built by, by, by King Solomon, but we also know the story of how it was destroyed and how it was wrecked by the Babylonians and then how it was, it was rebuilt uh, under the, the, the direction of, of, of Nehemiah and, 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 and never returned back to that, that, that majestic structure and towering place that it was under Solomon, but it remained this place where the people of Israel believed that God came to be with them. That though God wasn't contained and bound up in them, but that they could go there to that place and surely they could be in the presence of God, that it was a place that was holy, it was a place that was decreed, it was a place of unity where all of the different tribes of, of Israel could come together, that it was a place where there would be judgment that would be made and judgment was considered to be a good thing where justice could be enacted. And so they, 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 they went and sometimes you would go and when you make a pilgrimage, you go on behalf of all of your family and all of your relatives because everybody can't go. Everybody can't go all the time. So oftentimes when you're a pilgrim and you're making a pilgrimage, you're leaving other people behind. You're leaving relatives and friends uh, because they have, there's still crops that have to be tended to. There's still, there's still, uh, and, and, and again, like when I think about it in, in our context, if you're, if you're from the South in many places, um, this is a season when you're getting the ground prepared. This is the season when, when, when you are laying the foundation for the planting of your crops. And in Alabama, there was a tradition amongst many of the farmers that I worked with that Good Friday was, the, was, the, was the day you put all of your, you put all of your seeds in the ground. And, and, and for many of them, you look on the third day, you start seeing something come back up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So, um, this was a time where people would go on behalf of others and they would sing as they entered into the holy city are there questions about this psalm about 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 this tradition about what was happening in this first century during the time of passover okay so the next text that he gives and again there's so much that we read uh, within the, the these Gospels, and we're, we're, we're doing the Old Testament first before we get to Luke 19, but there's a passage that's referenced, and oftentimes when you look in your Bibles, you'll see it uh, uh, indented and set aside so you know that there is um, a, a, a quote or a passage that's coming from uh, a, a, a previous text, but we, we find a text from the prophet Zechariah chapter 9, verses nine through 10. And I would encourage you if, you, if you haven't had the opportunity to do it, to not only read the passages that McLaren commends to us to read, yeah. but to read all of, 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 yeah. of Zechariah 9, right? You read that, Mom? I did, because when I read just what he gave us, I go, what in the world is he talking about? Right. And so then I went back up and looked and it said that it was talking about 
the coming ruler of God and that uh, judgment. It was talking about the judgment of Israel and the enemies and then an oracle. And I wanted to ask you, what's the difference between an oracle and a prophet? Maybe because the, my thing said oracle. Yeah, well, well. so let me talk about what a prophet is first. You know, uh, a, a, a prophet is... Um, in a particular tradition within the, the, the Hebraic Judaic tradition is the Navi or the Navi'im prophets. They are ones who speak directly a word from God. Okay. okay? Uh, a, it's not necessarily, uh, as we talked about before, predicting the future or whatever else, but it's, it's someone who speaks a word from God. The, um, the oracular tradition is something which is even uh, larger than that. Uh, an oracle doesn't have to be a person. An oracle can be something that is revealed from the spirit world. I mean, the Gordian knot. There are there are you can throw cowrie shells. You can have oracle cards. There 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 are. It, it, it's it's something that really um, when 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 we look at at the the Hebrew Bible. And we pay attention. There, there are so many ancient traditions in terms of how people would come to receive a word from the spirit world. It could be from God. It could be from the gods. It could be from the spirits. It could be from the ancestors. In, in African traditional um, settings today, you can go to a shrine. You go to a particular place and you can um, communicate sometimes uh, uh, a, 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 a priest or a soothsayer or a so-called medicine man or woman or a seer might throw bones and tell you what the oracle says. You might ask a question, you know, about is it this or that? Is it yes or no? Should I go forward or stop? And so an oracle, you know, and, and, and to give, um, you know, a, 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 a basic general definition is it's it's put together as a particular revelation or word that's not tied or identified necessarily to a particular prophetic voice in terms of a genre of literature. But all of this comes out of the tradition of Zechariah. So a prophet could act. So I'm not, I'm sorry. So Zachariah, what was he an oracle? Or I always thought he was a prophet. I, you know, they always said the minor prophets because he's right before the, I think the last prophetic book. In the see, movie. see, we, I think in our modern day, sometimes we get confused by this because we watch the Matrix movies, mm. and the oracle is a person. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody else watched the Matrix, but so there's a woman, there's a black mm -hmm. woman who's yeah. called the oracle. Mm -hmm. All right. And so the oracle, if you to, to use that reference, you know that the oracle you go to ask a question, okay? And the oracle gives you an answer. And sometimes it's, you have to figure it out. You know, it's not really clear in terms of exactly what it, what, what, what it, what it, what it is. And sometimes it requires, and if we continue with the Matrix movie, um, a prophet, in order to bring interpretation to the oracle. So in the Matrix movies, Morpheus could, could be seen as a prophet who took what it is that the oracle told him and then communicated something larger and something greater through the interpretation. So sometimes there is some even interpretation that comes through a prophetic rendering as well. But the oracle is is just the is just the source is 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 the source. So when 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 it says um, and again all of these things, there's nothing in the original text that would say judgment of Israel's enemies and oracle. When you see that in your Bibles, it's trying to give you some guidance in terms of understanding the 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 genre or the kind of text that you're reading at that particular time. And, that's and so I... at the beginning of Zechariah, I don't want to spend much more time on this, but it does give 
a word about what is going to happen to all of God's people's enemies. enemies. Yeah. And the Israelites are God's people. And so it talks about uh, the land of Hadrach. Um, mm -hmm. It talks about the, 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 the cities where, where the enemies of Israel were organized and gathered. You know, it talks about Tyre and Sidon and Ashkelon and, and, and the kings of Gaza. And so if you read the first part of, of, of Zechariah 9, you will see who all the enemies are that this king is supposing to come to save. Now, all the enemies get worn out by a mighty God. I mean, there, there, there's, there, there's blood that runs, you know, there are people that are overcome, that, 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 are, that, are, that are killed, that are knocked down. But then in Zechariah 9, with the coming ruler of God's people, you know, after all this has been knocked down, there's a ruler, there's a king that is supposed to come and rule over the people after all these other enemies have been vanquished. And so someone read for us um, Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Can someone read that for us? Bruce, can you read that for us? The coming ruler of God's people. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo. Your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. So, so this passage, again, let's put it in context. At the beginning of Zechariah 9, the oracle says that all these enemies, all these kings, all these powers that have been oppressing God's people are going to get knocked down and wiped out. Just like the Egyptians did knocked down and wiped out and then after this victory is won there is a new king to be celebrated that's going to come in and there's not going to be all this war there's not going to be any more fighting there's not going to be any more violence the battle bow shall be cut off and this king will have dominion sovereignty from sea to sea from the river and even to the ends of the earth, from the Euphrates River even to the end of the earth. So this is a part of the prophetic word. This is what people were looking for. There, there's a promise of what's supposed to happen. Yeah, we're still going through some stuff. We've been going through some stuff all these years, but but God keeps rescuing us. God is going to send a new king. God is going to fix all of this. And the way that you will know, according to this particular prophecy, that it's your king, is that he doesn't come in in a, in a horse and chariot. He doesn't come in on a stallion that's kicking their the feet up, covered with armor carrying a, a, a pole with a golden eagle on top. He's humble. He's riding on a donkey, on a, on a small donkey, not even on a fully grown adult donkey, on a colt, the foal, the, the, the offspring, the, 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 the foal of a donkey. And he will cut off the chariot and the war horse. Remember, they're chariots and war horses that are up in Jerusalem right now. And the people are running down 
from Jerusalem where all of this procession of these Romans are going on with, with chariots and war horses and, and, and looky here, looky here. Who's coming in? So now we get to Luke 19 verses 29 through 46. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he went, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. That's always been really curious to me right there. <laughs> That, that he, he sends two of his disciples to go and take a donkey from somebody else's house. And if they get stopped, say the Lord needs it. What, do you, what, do you, what does that suggest to you? What do you think is happening with that? Anybody ever thought about that before? I thought it was like pre-planning that somebody had already gone and set up some things ahead of time. I mean, he, he, he had a, he had a lot of followers. They weren't just those 12. So right. he already made some plans with people ahead of time. Right. So it, it suggests that it was organized. It was intentional. It wasn't accidental. Jesus had already reserved the rental car. And this told him to go and pick it up. You know, and if they ask, well, who are you picking it up for? You know, picking it up for the Lord. That, that, that this wasn't something that just by happenstance, that Jesus just so happened to be riding on a donkey, on a colt, but that he was conscious of what needed to happen on this day. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I need for us to know that because because oftentimes we, we, we kind of think that that Jesus just randomly is, is is stumbling into things and that you know he he knows what the people are going to be looking for. And it seems to suggest here that there's some organization. So as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, and I want to talk about that for just a second before we get to what they said. So he's approaching the path. The whole multitude of his of the disciples. Now, who who who's who's being talked about there? Because I don't want us to be confused here necessarily, unnecessarily. Lots of times when we think of the disciples, we think of the twelve, right? We it think was of, his followers, people who were believing in him, who had seen what he had done. So, so th th this this is a, this is a, this is a general term. There's a multitude. There's a large group of people who may have also been organized. Mm -hmm. And as he was now approaching the path, again, like I said, you go up into Jerusalem, but right before you get into the city, if you come in from the from the way of the Mount of Olives, it goes down, and it's. It's their olive tree. Well, there used to be the olive trees that are all on this uh, this th this hill. Again, Mount. We oftentimes think mountain is not a mountain; it's a hill. Um, but there used to be a lot of uh, 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 olive trees on this, and there was a path that they would go down to get down into the city after you came up into Jerusalem. And so this 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 group of people may have also come up out of Jerusalem. They're part of the people who are already following him. But when they're praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, do we, do we remember what it is that, that may have been on their mind when, um, yep. 
when 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 this actual uh a, a triumphant entry you know had 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 occurred what might have been on their mind the resurrection of lazarus if yeah you 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 could go to the resurrection of lazarus you'd have to go to another gospel mm -hmm. but but in the gospel of but but certainly in the in the gospel of luke you could see how how jesus had healed a blind beggar you know you 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 would see how he had uh uh amazed zacchaeus and and and, and knew who he was but certainly the the, the bigger picture and, and and what's likely referenced here though not in the in the luke and text is that jesus had called had just before he goes down into jerusalem had 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 called Lazarus to come out of the grave. All right. He and, and this was something that had astounded so many people. Let me see if we can find it here. In the um uh the healing of blind Bartimaeus in the gospel of, of, of Mark. In the gospel of Matthew. And this occurs in Matthew 21. Jesus heals two blind men. And then in the Gospel of John. And again, you know, it's it's one of the reasons when when we, you know, spent our time um, last year and we were reading from the the uh the Gospel of, of of John, we 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 talk about how uh, how different the Gospel of John is from the other Gospels. That's one of the things that we dealt when we dealt with um, John. But in the Gospel of John is where you find right before uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Not only did Jesus bring Lazarus back Lazarus back from the dead, but there's even a plot to kill Lazarus before they even want to kill Jesus because they have to shut all of that down. But this crowd of people, you know, I, I, I imagine that, you know, the word had spread, had gone viral about Jesus and all these things that he had been doing throughout his public ministry all of the healings all of the blind people all of the casting out of demons all of the things the 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 feeding of the 4000 and the 5000 i mean these were things that they knew about and now they see this guy who had been doing all of these things who had been confounding even their leaders the the, the scribes and the pharisees and the herodians and so when they see him and he's riding on a colt, coming into Jerusalem at the same time that all of these war horses and chariots are marching through the streets of Jerusalem. Wow. And so they say, as I think Jesus expected them to say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. That they see this king coming. And then the Pharisee said, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Okay? If these were silent, the stones would shout out. Remember that the the prophecy in Zechariah is that what is the king going to bring? Is the king going to bring war and, and bring conflict? Peace. 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 So you could also read that in another way. And this is what I, what I, what I tried to encourage, that let them do what they're doing because they're welcoming this king that I am who comes to bring peace because we're going to study war no more. That's not what's going to continue. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the second time 
he wept, right? When was the first time Jesus wept in the Bible? When Lazarus died. Yeah. Not well, and not even when Lazarus died. Because Lazarus was already dead. Dead. He Lazarus was dead. had been dead. Yeah. So why do you think he was crying? And, and let me get somebody else to answer that, that question. Lazarus had been dead for four days at that point when Jesus showed up. Anybody? I mean, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. No one, no one believed that that he could do anything about lives of God. There you go, Bruce. Because people didn't know who he was. People didn't recognize that he had already conquered death, that he had this capacity to do this, that they did not see him for who he truly was. Verse 41, as he came near and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you even, if you even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Again, they didn't recognize. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation oh from God. God. Ooh. Mm. Oh my God. That as much as he organized and as much as he reserved the cult and came in humbly and came in from the east while the Romans were coming in from the west, they still couldn't see him. They still did not recognize him. They still did not know that they were in visitation, not from just a king, not from just a king like the kind that they that they that they were looking for as a political ruler, but that they were in visitation with God, that God was in their presence that God was in their midst. And if they could only see, and if they could only know, and if they could only believe who he was and what he was, then everything could be made different for them. Verse 45, then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And again, Jesus is speaking. Where I want to, I want to share some of where that comes from too. Wait a minute, I thought I had it here. Maybe I didn't. Um, that comes from uh, from both Isaiah and from Jeremiah. Um, boy, I truly thought that I I had put that in here. So. I'm taking a gamble here on my my memory. Uh, I think it's 58 and 3, but it might be 7. Oops, I spelled Isaiah wrong. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Hmm. No, that's not it. So I, I'm pretty sure that it's also, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll get the, the Isaiah text, Jeremiah 7, 17. No, that's not it either. Okay, hang on. Let me, let me, let me just pull it for you right quick. So, the I think it's seven eleven. I should always remember seven eleven. <laughs> so Jeremiah uh chapter seven verse eleven says, Has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? You know I too am watching, says the Lord. 
and it's not Isaiah 58, it's Isaiah 56. In Isaiah 56 and 7, what happened to it so this is what happened before mm -hmm. i put it in and then it yeah, isaiah 56 and 7 says these i will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer the burnt offerings and the sacrifice will be accepted from my house, shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So when you hear Jesus speaking uh, at the temple, he's really putting together Jeremiah 7, 11 about having made it a den of robbers mm -hmm. and my house will be a house of prayer. You know, it's, and you know, it's interesting, you know, it, it, it is, it is written and that the the way that the the quotation is put together here is is really interesting because it, it is a blending of two different texts of Isaiah fifty six and seven and Jeremiah seven uh, and eleven. So so Jesus is um, and we'll and we'll talk more about the temple uh, maybe may, maybe next week. But this is. This this is the text, and again, we we, we looked at Matthew twenty one. Um, we looked at uh, Mark twelve, uh, Mark eleven, or Mark 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 eleven, John twelve. Uh, this story of of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem is something that shows up throughout all of the Gospels. Very different in different accounts but all rooted in these, these Hebrew Bible, these Old Testament texts. But as much as they're rooted and connected, people still don't really get who Jesus is and what Jesus is and why Jesus is there. And, and so Norma, for me, And that, and that used to, you know, when, when you talked about how looking to the future and how they changed up on Friday, you know, that, that's, that's, that's been something that I have focused on a lot when I've looked at this celebration each year. But as, I, as I'm preparing for this Sunday, I think I'm feeling some, um, some empathy that I hadn't always felt before. Um, because particularly when you read like at the beginning of Zechariah 9 and you see all the things and all of the ways that people were struggling, that they were just looking for any sign of, 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 of hope or help and running to it because they were desperate. I mean, think about this. Think about, think about when the COVID-19 vaccine first came out. Because it was it was like around this time, a little bit early in March, for most people you might have got in March, but it was springtime, and as soon as people got that shot, they were running out in the streets, you know they 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 they, they was they were snatching off those masks, they were just so happy to be in crowds once again, especially the young people. Mm -hmm. They, they, they were having to say they were going to send young people home from school and everything else. And, 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 and again, I know my son got COVID-19. Mm -hmm. my, so, my son got COVID-19 right around that time during spring break. Mm -hmm. And because everybody thought they started throwing house parties again. And, and they were, and we were just under it at that point for one year. We had been under the weight of quarantine and sequestration and all of the difficulties of COVID for one year. These people had been under the weight of the oppression of different empires 
for hundreds and hundreds of years. They would go from one pandemic to the next. We get frustrated when we go from, from, from Delta to Omicron. Well, they did Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma. They were going through all of it. They were going from Egyptians they were going to, to Assyrians, they were going to Babylonians, they were going to Persians, they were going to Medes, and now here they were with the Romans. And so when there was a sign that looked just like it was supposed to look, there was a cure that was supposed to come for all of this, then they got excited and, 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 and they began to shout and they began to celebrate. And yes, if we, as we follow in the week, Jesus went in and he, and he turned over the temple, he turned over the tables, ran out the money changers, got his whip, ran out the, 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 the animals and the things that they were doing in the temple that they had turned to, uh, it into a den of robbers, no longer a house of prayer. But then, and we talked about this, on Thursday, what happened to the king? He betrayed, right? He was betrayed, and what happened to him? He was arrested. He got locked up. Got arrested. Yeah. How's the king going to get locked up? How's the liberator? How's the how's the one that, that, that that's been prophesied that's gonna break the bowl, that's gonna get rid of the war horses, that's gonna and now he's locked up and he's in the custody of the Romans. He's in the custody of the Romans, and then the Romans give them a choice. They had two choices, right? And I know we jump, we're jumping into the story, but we're going to talk more about the readings for, for next week because we have one for Thursday, we have one for Friday, then we have one for Saturday, I think, and we have one for Easter. But they gave them, they gave them two choices. Who were the two choices? Set one free, Pontius Pilate. Which one do you want to set free? The murderer. <laughs> Barabbas or Jesus? Barabbas or Jesus. And, and, and Bruce said Barabbas was supposed to be a murderer. A murderer, yeah. That's what one text says. The other text says that he was a, he was a zealot. Zealot, yeah. So if he was a zealot, then who he likely kill? The Romans. A Roman. Roman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You didn't get put up for crucifixion for killing other Jews. Right. Black on black, Jew on Jew violence. They might not even do an investigation. Mm. Mm. 9 was a joke even back then. But if you killed a Roman, mm -hmm. if you were an outlaw, if you were a bandit, if you were a zealot, and you attacked and you were a cop killer, because mm. that's what Barabbas was. Mm -hmm. Barabbas was a murderer who killed a Roman soldier that you got Jesus who came in on a donkey and then got locked up and Barabbas, at least the one who, 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 who took out at least one of them, hmm. which one you want? You want the one that talks to talk or you want the one that walks to walk? And they said, set Barabbas free. Hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll get more into that next week. That, that, that's, that, that, that's our next week uh, of Bible study. But but I but I wanted to put all of the, the the this in in context for us in terms of the scripture as we just listen as we just listen and imagine I want you to imagine who you are in the story you get to pick what character you're gonna be you get to be either one of the disciples that goes and gets the rental donkey. You get to be somebody in the crowd. That's that that's well, there's no way even in problems in this one. Putting taking off your coat and putting it down in front of the 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 the, the donkey. 
you get to be the scribes, the Pharisees that say, shh, tell them to be quiet. Pick who you want to be, but just listen to this peace march, Palm Sunday. Let's, uh, let's imagine ourselves just outside of Jerusalem. We are with Jesus and his band of disciples early on a Sunday morning. Jesus has walked many a mile since he taught us that day on the hillside in Galilee. He has told many a parable, answered many a question, and asked even more earlier this morning. He did something really strange. He sent two of our number into a town on the Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem from the east. He said they would find a donkey's colt tied to a tree. The two disciples should untie it and bring it to him, and if anyone asked about it, they should simply say, the master needs it. And guess what? That was exactly what happened, and they brought the, the, the colt to Jesus. The colt, of course, didn't have a saddle on it, so we, so we took some of our coats and put them on the donkey, and then we lifted Jesus up onto it, and we started down the road that led to Jerusalem. So now we walk with him, and at first it's quiet with only the sound of the, the donkeys clomping on the road, and the wind blows through the, through, the, through the olive trees. We don't have any idea what he has planned. Mommy, I don't want you to read. I want you just to listen. I see you reading. <laughs> okay. Making notes. Just listen. Just listen. Then we hear something up ahead. What is it? A crowd is gathering. Children, young folk are shouting. Palm branches, not in Luke, are waving. People are taking their coats and spreading them on the dusty road to make a lavish multicolored carpet as if Jesus were a king being welcomed to the capital. More and more people join our parade as we descend the hill. Eventually we feel our confusion giving away to excitement. We shout and dance and praise God together as we descend the road that leads to Jerusalem. Our voices echo across the valley. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, we shout. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Now, some Pharisees who have been a part of the crowd are getting uncomfortable. They slide up to Jesus and sternly warn him that, thank you, Jesus, this is dangerous. He should order us all to be quiet. They, they're worried that proclaiming Jesus as king will be seen as a revolutionary act, the kind that might bring Roman soldiers riding in on their horses, swords and spears in hand to slaughter us all in the name of law and order. But Jesus refuses to silence us. If they are silent, the rocks will start shouting, he says. That comes from a scripture passage too about the walls, the stones of the wall speaking out. So our parade continues. We shout louder than ever after our long journey over these last three years. It feels as if things are finally reaching their climax. We, 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 we round a bend and there is Jerusalem spread before us in all her beauty. The temple glistening in the sun, a reverent silence descends upon our parade. It's a sight that has choked up many a pilgrim. But Jesus doesn't just get choked up. He actually begins to weep. The crowd clusters around him and he speaks to Jerusalem, if only, if only you knew on this day of all days the things that lead to peace, he says through his tears, but you can't see. You can't see. A time will come when your enemies will surround you and you will be crushed and this whole city leveled all because you didn't recognize the meaning of this moment of God's visitation. What a shock from a shouting, celebrating crowd to the sound of Jesus weeping from the feeling 
that we were about to finally win a prediction of massive military defeat from joyful laughter to tears. So we continue descending the road toward Jerusalem. We also descend into the quiet of our own thoughts. We begin whispering among ourselves about what's, what's really happening. Somebody reminds us of the words from, from the prophet Zechariah. The prophet said, rejoice greatly. Daughter Zion, sing aloud, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king will come to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the offspring of a donkey, a shiver. A recognition runs through us, but then one of us asks, well, what comes next? What, what did the prophet Zechariah say after that? And, and someone else has the, has the passage memorized. It says that he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and, and the war horse from Jerusalem. The, the bow used in battle will be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations. His rule will stretch from sea to sea and the river to the ends of the earth. Suddenly we feel the full drama of this moment. We recall a, another parade, another parade that frequently occurs on the other side of Jerusalem. Whenever Herod rides into the city in full procession from his headquarters in Caesarea Philippi, he enters not on a young donkey, but on a mighty war horse. He comes in the name of Caesar, not in the name of the Lord. He isn't surrounded by a ragtag crowd holding palm branches and waving their coats. He's surrounded by chariots and accompanied by uniformed soldiers with their swords and spears and bows held high. His military procession is a show of force intended to inspire fear and compliance, not hope and joy especially during this time of Passover. So the meaning of this day begins to become clear to us. Caesar's kingdom, the empire of Rome rules by fear with threats of violence demanding submission, but God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven rules by faith with a promise of peace, inspiring joy and Jesus's tears. Jesus' tears are telling us something. He knows. He knows that our leaders are not going to listen to him. They are going to respond to Caesar's violence with violence of their own. And that's why Jesus just made that dire prediction. Our minds are reeling with these realizations as Jesus leads our little parade into Jerusalem and straight to the temple. Post Jesus, he causes a big scene. He drives out the merchants who sell animals for sacrifice. He drives out those who exchange foreign currency for the temple currency. And again, we know there is great meaning in his actions. Again, he is challenging assumptions about the necessity of sacrifice and about the need for opulent temples and all they represent. And this time he links together quotes from two of our greatest prophets, from Isaiah 56 and 3. Jeremiah 7, 11, my house will be a house of prayer for all peoples, Isaiah said, but you have turned it into a hideout for crooks, Jeremiah said. It's been quite a day. This will be a Sunday we'll never forget. The beginning of a week we'll never forget. What a wild mix of emotions. What a collection of dramatic moments. And as we all fall asleep, we ponder this. To be alive is to learn what makes for peace. What makes for peace? It's not more weapons, more threats, more fear. It's more faith. It's more freedom. It's more hope. It's more love, it's more joy. Blessed is the one 
who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one Hallelujah. who comes in the name of the Lord. And we wave our palms and say, Hosanna, praise ye the Lord. Bless him who cometh to bring us salvation. And the words Hosanna, Hosanna. Are, can be translated as save us now. Mm. That's what that means. Hosanna. Save us now. And that's what the people were looking for. That's what the people were desiring. That's what the people were hoping for. But they didn't quite know what they were looking at. They didn't quite know how they were going to be saved. You see, we have a benefit. This is normal. Why I was saying I feel some empathy. 2,000 years later, mm -hmm. we know who Jesus is. 2,000 years later, we can, we can have 2020 vision. Yeah. They saw this Jesus, a man that, 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 that didn't have much to his name, a man who was the, the, the son of Mary and the carpenter, uh, a, a man who was from Nazareth, wasn't from Jerusalem, didn't have education, wasn't formally uh, a part of any of these institutions. And here he is coming in, riding in on a rental car. And he's going to, and they hoped so much. They had so much hope. They, But it came and it went. It came and it went pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. And, you know, the irony is today, I often wonder in the church if we really believe that Jesus is Jesus, that Jesus is God. Do we really know what makes for peace today? Because I hear us say all kinds of other things in the midst of discussions about war and peace and military might and this, that, and the other. It's not more weapons, more threats, more fear, more occupations, more invasions, more military budgets. It's more faith, it's more freedom, it's more hope, it's more love, it's more joy. That's what Jesus said to us. That's what Jesus taught us. That's what Jesus showed us. If you only knew what would make for peace. And I wonder if we know today. That's all I have for today. What are your, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What are your comments as we close? Thoughts, comments, reflections, final reflections as we close. What I love about Jesus, when we read, I think it was in verse 41, you, even you, you can't see, still did it anyway. He still loved us that much. He still loves us that much. He, knew, he knows we're all a hot mess and he'll still be like, no, I love you. I know. Willing to die. God. He thought I was to die for. I love that song. I love, yes. I mean, that, that's, that's why we praise him. <laughs> Rome, Rome, America, the empire will never do that, right? You'll never see that. God. It's a, it's a nice, this is a very good way. It's just, I haven't learned like this before, except through Bible study about what this means coming in. Just, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot that they were looking for. And you know, I, I remember what Paul said in, in 
to the church at Corinth. He said, we see, but we only see in part. Mm -hmm. We see through a glass dimly. And they certainly were only seeing, you know, like I, like the, the magic helmet I talked about in church on, on Sunday that had the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they saw what they wanted to see. They saw their own needs being met. They saw their own challenges, their own, um, but how is where they really got it wrong. You know, they, later there, 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 there would be an uprising. There would be a violent uprising against, against the Romans. Mm -hmm. And they would be wiped out. Ouch. Many lives that would be lost. Mm -hmm. And. Go ahead, no. I was just saying, Jesus told them that when he was crying over Jerusalem, that. It was going to be wiped out, and I and you know I didn't know how long it was, and so I did do a little bit of research, and it's like forty years later, and what was his name? Titus, I think. T Titus Augustus, mm -hmm. and they they just wiped out Jerusalem down to the studs, basically, the cities, the temples, they just. And it was like Nicole was saying in, in, in the scripture that Sharon had us to do for Lectio Divina uh, in Ephesians, when we talk about, that's, that's what we were seeing. It was the last sentence that said, the depth, the length, the breadth, the height of love, if we can just all do that. And it says we all come together to do that. It's, wow. And Jesus showed us that, like Nicole was saying, in spite of. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, family, uh, for next week, mm -hmm. and if you and if you follow in your book, uh, McLaren has a couple of different A, B, and C uh, for Holy Week. So there's chapter 32A, which is for Holy Thursday. Um, there's, and, and, if you, and if you follow that, you'll see um, there's then 32B, which is Good Friday. And then there's 32C, which is Holy Saturday. So there's a lot more reading um, this time. If you start, it starts on page 152. It ends on page 166. You know, what I'd like for you to do is uh, um, go ahead and to read those chapters, 32A, 32B, and 32C, and even though we're gonna be on Wednesday, we'll be the day before, these will lay the foundation for our understanding. And, and not all churches do anything on Holy Thursday or Maundy Thursday. And not all churches even do um, anything on Good Friday. You know, in, in the black church tradition, we do seven last words. Uh, in, many, in many churches, sometimes there will be other sorts of gathering or observances most churches that I know don't do Holy Saturday um, and don't do anything on Saturday. But um, I want you to pay attention to, particularly on the 32C for Holy Saturday, there are some, some scriptures that he wants us to read. Psalm 77, Psalm 88, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and John 10, verses 1 through 22. Um, there's also some scripture readings for 32b, which is for Good Friday, Psalm 22, and Luke 22, 39 through 23, 56. So there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of reading. And, and I'll just say this, do, do as much as you can. Uh, I will say this is less reading than we used to read, um, mm -hmm. than we used to read in our other Bible study. <laughs> We'd have a whole lot more pages. Yeah. But I, I would just 
So, so do as much as you can. At least get Maundy Thursdays reading. And that comes with selections from the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17. So if you can't get anything else done, read 32A, which goes from page 152 to page 157. That's five pages. And then read those. Um, and it's not the whole chapters. There's passages from the, from the chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So if you can read that, you'll be rereading it because we just read the Gospel of John last year for many of us. So it, it'll be familiar uh, to you. But we will try to cover um, all three of these sections on next Wednesday. And we'll, um, we won't read through all of the scriptures together. So I'm going to need you to read the scriptures on your own. But we will read through the, um, the chapters together. And I'm going to... Um, uh, ask you all to do some reading for us when we when we read for next week. But um, I want to wish you a, a blessed Holy Week. Um, the next time we gather together, we'll be in the middle of it. Um, Holy Week starts with Palm Sunday, which is what we explored today, uh, and it and, and it is uh, the most important time of the Christian calendar. Uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we aren't going to deal with um, Resurrection Sunday uh, until um, the week after, and uh, you, you're going to have a guest uh, instructor on that day, uh, so on the Wednesday after Easter, which I think is the 20th, maybe the 20th of, uh, the 20th of April, mm -hmm. 18, 19, 20, yeah, yeah. Um, but we will really explore what happens during Holy Week and things for us to reflect upon and how we can situate ourselves inside of the narrative when we get together next week. All right? So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for your people called by your name. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for all of your efforts, all of your planning, all of your organizing, all of your all of your love, Lord God, and, and please just forgive us for continuing not to be able to see you, for, for all that is bound up and hidden within our own hosannas, all of, the, all of the shouting, all of the things that we might do, all of the ceremony and ritual that we might seek to recreate, but let us be mindful that as we recreate this ritual, we also recreate the blindness we also recreate the things that we were unable to see in you, even when you intentionally showed us the fulfillment of prophecy in your triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And you showed us throughout the course of the week. Continue to guide us and lead us in this study. And thank you for all of those who have committed portions of their day and of their lives to come together with this group to ask the question, what thus saith the Lord? Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.